Okay then, basically trying to come back to my planetary uh, correspondences for the rune mushroom card as I was, um, as I had, you know, sort of hinted at it at the process yesterday. Um, I'm still not completely sure how serious all this is for me even. Um, it's kind of worked out better than I expected and this is what it looks like at this stage where I basically um, reordered my little um, setups for each rune as you can see there's a rune on each little piece of paper here I stuck all this into my uh, you know supposed grimoire or whatever you like to call that um, where I put this kind of, to kind of stuff once I'm kind of done with it or need to keep it somewhere. Because um, it turns out that when I try to really order them according to uh, which, for example, in this case, which planet was at the top of my little heptagon, like this is what they look like, like this, okay. Um, I put the four uh, cards, or yeah, the four runes at the top that have the sun at the top of the heptagon. Then there's four with the moon at the top. There's three that have Mercury, and it turns out I had to redo the U rune uh, to fit in there because it was originally a Mars planet at the top there, but I felt that there should have been it should it should be you know equally evenly spaced throughout so more or less symmetrical all this is i'm what i'm why i'm doing this it is basically because um these are actually the seven visible planets as they were known to humankind throughout antiquity until today. So also in the time of the runes, these would have been um, maybe used or maybe even used to navigate by, which was a, quite a big deal um, for the Vikings in those days. So this being the Isa rune over here, let me just go into that as an example of what this, um, how this kind of worked out for me. Like I said, Yesterday, it uh, <clears throat> sort of kind of came to me really quickly. What I get here is, <coughs> sorry, is um, a setup with actually Saturn. You would say, I might say now that Saturn rules the ice rune. Okay, that's my first um, kind of a standpoint here. You, I just had to decide which of those seven angles means what. The angle, the position with respect to the other positions would mean something, right? I place the image and the rune and all the rest of it uh, in a particular uh, relationship to each other. So it's like exploring also what this heptagon can do in a way. So I I still think it's interesting. Yes. So back to my setup here for me. And this isn't really like an absolute science or any of it. It may look a bit scientific or pseudo scientific, I hope, in a way. But it, it really isn't. It's just my approach of trying to, um, I don't know, get a taste for the relationships between these forces where... Saturn, the thing between those seven, basically what happens, the difference between the seven is they're all life forces and the speeds at which they express themselves are different. So in that sense, the sun and the moon are um, closest in the sense that they're, even they are really different because they're, um, you know, luminaries. So we live by the sun and the moon. So that's actually something else, but they do have a lot to do with identity in a horoscope, for example. Then, in terms of speed, again, coming back to that, there's 
first Mercury, which is always, you know, associated with the sign of Gemini, among others. Um, it has everything to do with picking up um, short term, short wavelength ideas, basically. It's a world of ideas, the world of Mercury. And from there on out, you go to moving away from the Earth, basically in the sense in the orbits and all that. You go to Venus, which has a lot more to do with longer term relationships with people and what goes in comes out and so on and so forth. There's a lot of exchanging of energies in there. Uh, then on to Mars, which has yet another level of self-definition in it and which, which will um, sometimes be needed and sometimes not, you know, things like that. And then moving outward from there, Jupiter and Saturn. So those two are really the last, they're the most grown up in a way. They're the oldest uh, in the old mythologies, in the Greek uh, mythologies, Saturn, I believe, is Jupiter's father, um, Kronos, uh, Zeus's father, you know, that way, more or less, give or take. <laughs> um, it's not really my field, but, you know, you've read about those types of things where one old god is replaced by his son and they have a fight and all that. So, um, all that is kind of in here, all the mythology, whatever, uh, whenever I really feel like that's uh, kind of relevant. And yes, I sort of decide for myself what, uh, what I think is really relevant, what's most important to me. And I see this as this particular rune, in this particular case, I would see as a life force starting at the bottom of the card here with those two. That is really intense and it gets kind of, I don't know, it, there's a process upwards along the hexagon, like so, and it, uh, it transforms and it comes out. It is sort of pressed into a shape or crystallized into a shape at the end by, at the end by Saturn. So, um... Because I suppose that it is easier for Mercury to deal with Mars, Mercury will hinder Mars in his process. It will stop him. And then Jupiter kind of does the same to Mercury because each time there's this halting movement, it's like your priorities have to change if you move from Mercury to Jupiter it's all of a sudden okay now it's about more people all of a sudden it isn't only about an idea anymore you know there's actually more to this than meets the eye so the solar energy this is actually an easier path on this side the solar energy moving into Venus becoming a body basically and then the body becoming an emotional life in the moon right there and then the emotional life being brought to a sudden halt by Saturn in a way you know and there's there's relationships all around this seven-sided affair here which I think are just interesting to look at and I kind of actually am rather pleased that I managed to develop really quickly these different layers four where actually there's three three and three four respectively saturn jupiter and mercury and four runes each four what does that say really in total it means to me that the runes the meanings of the runes as i sort of know them by now are evenly spaced across our experience whereas with tarot, we know that. We know that's the case. Everything is in tarot, right? That's why it works. And I've always myself missed the grasp of that level of understanding in the runes. Um, I've been doing a bit more research. I've actually dig dug up the... Um, let me pick this up over here. The... Um, 
Anglo-Saxon rune poem again. This is, I've got two translations of these. There's a wiki, um, wiki source, what's it called? Website, um, that has the same text, like so. Wiki source, free online library, that's what it says. The Anglo-Saxon, so I used to work with this stuff when I was uh, a student back in, um, you know, 25 years ago. Um, I've always, you know, enjoyed reading this kind of stuff. I've copied out parts of the translation that was made actually in the 18th century. And so it's a bit literary, this translation that you get on the wiki source is um, a bit on the fancy side. And here and there you can see that there's a lot more text on this end than there is on this end, which really illustrates how concise and um, often the Anglo-Saxon, the old English language, needs only two or three words to say what you will get three and a half phrases in modern English for. See? So um, I'm Dutch nationality, so I can read some of this and then I go off into a tangent where I'm not supposed to because I'm assuming things mean something. However, there's also a really cool old English translating device on the internet that I've used just now in order to uh, get a hold of some of this, uh, you know, more complicated stuff here. So the other translation that I've showed you first, this one here, is actually... Uh, really nice, especially to compare to the old one. And there are a couple of rather major differences. And there's a couple of things that I don't really understand or any of it. It's very mysterious and it's really cool to be working on in the winter time. And so if I go back to my Isa rune just now here at the top, ice is really cold, measurelessly slippery glistening clear as glass, most like gemstones, a floor created by frost and a fair face. That's what he says. This is a new, uh, newer translation done by Dr. Aaron Hostetter. Really fun guy. Sounds like a great teacher to have. Not anymore for me, I'm afraid. The old translation is over here. Ice is very cold and immeasurably slippery. It glistens clear as glass and mostly to gems. It is a floor wrought by frost. Fair to look on. So that's different. Fair to look on the floor. Okay? See? There's differences like that. I'm going back to Hostetter here to see because he says, and a fair face. A floor created by frost and a fair face. So then, of course, I do have to absolutely go back to the original. Um, and you can see here, it is a floor wrought, wrought by frost. Floor, forste gewacht. Feier an sich, ansinne. So, fair to look on. I'm, on this case, I would tend to go with the older translation myself. Doesn't really matter all that much. Um, the other thing I looked at is there's also um, Old Norse and Icelandic rune poems. And E is in there as well. Of course, it means the same thing. When there's no comment on this end, it's like they've either they've skipped that rune or they've used the same um, meaning for them. However, the system is a lot less explicit in the other two uh, Scandinavian rune poems. There, um, it's almost as if you're being, if you have, as if you were having, if you, as if you had dice with the runes on them, and each die is actually, it, it is kind of magical in a way. It's very suggestive, and most of it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Whereas in here, the Anglo-Saxon copy monk who copied this out in the 13th century, or whenever it was, originally, the manuscript is gone, by the way. The only manuscript that we had is gone. It's a crying shame. Um, 
he it looks like he tried to make a more a bit more of a bit more sense of it so he tried to sort of create nice poetic lines and generally um Here, for example, Vunyo, I thought that's another cool one. Bliss he enjoys who knows not suffering, sorrow or anxiety and has pr prosperity and happiness and a good enough house. That's what it says on this end. And um, Saras and Sorya, <laughs> sorrow and anxiety. Um, that makes me laugh because in Yiddish it is also Soros, having... Having sores, having trouble. That's a, a very old and very problematic word, apparently. Um, where was I? Winyo win then means joy. That's rather easy. So if I go back to my planetary disposition, dispositions, whatever that means, really, um, I find Wunyo over here in Venus's range. Okay, so the one that has Venus at the top. So Venus is predominant, the planet, if you like, or the influence or the goddess or whatever you like to way you like to look at this, is dominant. And she has two pals on each side of her that make her strong. Jupiter, she's not a daddyless daughter, this one, and the sun. So those three al already are kind of unconquerable and all the others are like down here. So Mercury and Saturn are really subservient to Venus here. It's a power play in a way between the between the figures, you know? And uh Joy Munio is all about being there and not about necessarily about communication or about dis discrimination or even about moods and phases of things or opposition none of that is relevant to joy so i'm hoping this helps i am not saying that i believe any of this it's just fun to mess around with so thank you for watching as always bless you and i will see you again soon okay thank you guys bye bye